Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise. And with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I believe in God, our Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, the psalm for today is Psalm 93. Psalm appointed for the last day of the church year. The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed and he is put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world's established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Did, um, I think, uh, Nord here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I passed the note. Hey, Dennis, can you turn the heater down a little bit? You're doing it right now. Pull it right on me. <laughs> Makes it hard to speak um, or breathe. I'm going to take this off. Warm it up. Okay, so we are nearing the end of the Augsburg Confession. We're um, on Article 18 and 19 today. And these two are going to go together. And you'll see why in just a minute. So let's read them together. Uh, and then we'll move on and talk about these. So on free will. Our churches teach that, that a person's, person's will has some freedom to choose civil righteousness and to do subject to reason. He has no power without the Holy Spirit to work the righteousness of God, that is, spiritual righteousness. But the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. This righteousness is worked in the heart when the Holy Spirit is received through the Word. This is what Augustine says in his Hypognosticon, Book 3. We grant that all people have a free will. It is free as far as it has the judgment of reason. This does not mean that it is able, without God, either to begin or at least to complete anything that has to do with God. It is free only in works of this life, whether good or evil. Good all those works that spring from the good in nature, such as to labor in the field, to eat and drink, to have a friend, to clothe oneself, to build a house, to marry a wife, to raise cattle, to learn various useful arts, or whatsoever good applies to this life. For all of these things depend on the providence of God. They are from Him and exist through Him. Works that are willing to worship an idol, to commit murder, and so forth, I call evil. 
Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who teach that without the Holy Spirit, by natural power alone, we are able to love God above all things and do God's commandments according to the letter. Although nature is able in a certain way to do outward work, for it is able to keep the hands from theft and murder, yet it cannot produce the inward motions, such as the fear of God, trust in God, chastity, patience, and so on. We're going to keep going. We're going to do one more article that's way shorter. Uh, our churches teach that although God creates and preserves nature, the cause of sin is located in the will of the wicked, that is, the devil and ungodly people. Without God's help, this will turns away from God. As Christ says, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. So now we see the will is talked about in both. They're connected. Remember, the numbering is something we did to sort of help us navigate. <laughs> kind of like in the Bible where we have chapters and verses. And man, that's still blowing incredible heat on there. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> It feels good over there. And right, it's hitting me from both sides. That's what's happening. I'm like, whoa! We can just point to some miles. So free will. This is an area where there is much confusion today, and I, I think uh, a lot of our sort of other problems in theology, and, I, and what I mean is between different churches, is rooted in what we believe about man, about original sin, which was one of the first articles we looked at, as well as uh, how original sin and free will go together, right? Because we're because now we're dealing with the cause of sin and sin itself. And by sin, we don't mean necessarily just the actions, but the original sin. Uh, and somebody tell me about original sin. Where where is it originate? <laughs> and where in the Bible, I guess? It's oh, Genesis. Genesis 3, right? In the beginning, but not really in the beginning. Because uh, in the beginning, we didn't have it. We didn't have this issue. Uh, we didn't have this problem of wills. And we'll get into that a little bit, because I think uh, the sheet that I have here is sort of helpful, even though it's dealing with another subject of sanctification. We're going to look at the will and how that's involved in this. Because there's a whole lot of problems that we see um, that end up happening when we... Oh, that just turns off. Um, but when, when we're dealing with... Uh, Sort of, okay, well, if I can do something or I can contribute something to salvation, that changes things. So look here at, at 8. This is sort of the false teaching that I think we still deal with all the time. Mary, yes. I was raised Roman Catholic. Roman, yeah. So, and, and, and some of this, some of it was similar that was taught. In fact, what they said... They said, we agree with it for the most part. And then there's some differences we'll talk about. But yeah, that's right. So you learned about original sin there, originally. But you've learned about it here, too, right? So with this, uh, we deal with these people called the Pelagians. And this was a heresy that was condemned under, under the name <coughs> of uh, St. Augustine. So this is an old, old heresy. Um, and, and quite honestly, you could argue that it's like the, it's the heresy of Cain, <laughs> right? Remember Cain and Abel? Remember the two brothers? One of them had a sacrifice that was accepted, the other one didn't. Uh, so anytime we're dealing with me being able to contribute or do something, post-fall, we're dealing with this Pelagian heresy at some level. This is kind of the way in church history it goes. We call these heresies different things. It gets named after a dude or 
the woman or whoever that, that sort of brings it in. And yet we know that it's, it's as old as the devil, right? Uh, and, and his fall. So, um, <coughs> Let's just look at the, what, what the Pelagians uh, teach a little bit, because we can't really go into all their teaching. Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who teach that without the Holy Spirit, by natural powers alone, that's the key here to this uh, error, by natural powers, or you could say natural ability, uh, or our born will or capacity to choose or not to choose, Right? We are able to love God above all things. What's love God above all things? What commandment would that be? <laughs> the first, the chief command, right? The one from which everything else flows to have no other God. So, above, so basically, you could, by your natural powers, you could obey the first commandment. You could have no other God. You would just choose to love God above all things and then do everything that follows from it. Every other commandment. Do God's commandment according to the letter. Meaning every part of it. The motive, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And loving your neighbor as you love yourself. You can do that if you try hard enough. That's a summary of that teaching. Now it comes in different forms. But yeah, Dave. Did these people ever have children? <laughs> they know that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> No, we, we can see that it's false, yeah. But, uh, but, but you can also, we can also convince ourselves of just about anything, too, right? <coughs> Walt, did you have something a second ago? Nope. Okay. okay. So, according to the letter, um, although nature, and so the response is, although nature is able, in a certain way, to do the outward work, because remember with the commandment, there's both the outward work, there's the behavior, or the thing outwardly, and then there's something else that's in the heart, right? That's why you do what you do. That's the inward part. So part of what we're saying here in this confession is, although we can, to a certain degree, do the outward things, we can not kill somebody. We can, hang on just a second, Mary. I'll get to you in a little bit. We'll have a time for questions. So we, we'll have... Um, like, we could say, well, okay, good, I can keep myself from stealing. I can keep myself from sleeping with somebody who's not my wife. I can keep myself from, you know, I can show up at church every Sunday and say, yeah, I'm outwardly keeping the Sabbath commandment. Or I can have a regular time of prayer and have it every day where it's just this is what I do, and that's the second commandment. Um, I cannot have any outward idolatry. I have no idols in my homes. You say, I don't have idolatry. Um, so that's the idea of the, we can keep it outwardly. And we know that generally, some people actually do that. I think one of the examples in the Bible would be what? Can you think of somebody in the Bible that maybe outwardly did keep those commandments? I was raised Roman Catholic. Right, right. That's right. Uh, and, and sometimes they would teach those commandments too. Yeah. Um, so can you think of somebody in the Bible who actually <coughs> would have kept those maybe since he was a boy? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Well, Jesus kept them not just outwardly. I'm saying outwardly. The rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, right? Remember, he says, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. And he came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus, where did Jesus point him first? Well, first he, he pointed him to ten of them. Right? These commandments. You know the commandments. And he starts listing some of them. Um, and, and, and so we wouldn't, sometimes people take that and they say, well, no, uh, he couldn't have. He couldn't have kept those. He couldn't have thought he kept those. I think he did think he kept those. I don't think we have any reason to doubt that. Yeah. Uh, and, and notice, some people argue that it's because Jesus didn't want to point it out that he'd broken X, Y, and Z commandment, uh, which is true because he does kind of go show him the first one that he doesn't do it because he goes away sad because he has lots of other gods 
is God is money. Um, but outwardly, I think he thought, yeah, I'm doing a pretty good job. And I think this is sort of the religion of America, if you will. When we think of like American Christian, when somebody says, yeah, I'm Christian, it's just kind of, I do my best, I follow the Ten Commandments. Isn't that kind of what we think of? Uh, and if, if maybe you don't know that, that's probably what your neighbors, the people that you work with that have some sort of idea of Christianity, they think Christianity is being good, doing good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's the, one of the biggest excuses people give for not going to church? Because we're hypocrites. All the hypocrites in there. Well, in fact, uh, we'll hear people say, in fact, I know for a fact that they don't do the Ten Commandments because I've worked with Christian business so-and-so guy. And guess what? He doesn't pay his bills on time. Right? Or I've worked with so-and-so, uh, Christian mechanic has the big Jesus fish out front. And, you know, maybe has John 3.16 on all his business card. But then, but he cheats me. And I caught him cheating. And he charges me way too much or whatever it is, right? You can come up with a million reasons. Because people think that church is, and I think this is what people. sinful flesh does, Right? We, we make it all about not what the Lord gives, but what? What we do. What we do. Or don't do. Right? Uh, and the don't do is, is the biggest for us. I don't do this. And so when uh, we used to joke about uh, what it meant to be a good Baptist growing up, and we'd say, well, it means you don't smoke, you don't chew, and you don't go with girls that do. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. I smoke, don't drink. That, that was my, uh, that was my uh, outward works theology in jest. But that's kind of what you think. You're like, well, I'm not dating anybody bad. They go to church too. They're kind of Christian. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I, I do this. And, and maybe it is me. And I give some money. And I do this. <coughs> but as you said before, it often that aches at people's consciences and then it leads to despair yeah mm -hmm. well and what yeah what we know happens in life right is that real stuff strikes us like the the real nasty stuff the bite of sin or the sting of sin which is death which is suffering which is all the <coughs> sickness all kinds of stuff right and you're like uh oh I'm not as good of a Christian as I thought, right? Uh, and and so that that stuff sort of exposes the facade of our external civil righteousness, if you will. But the point here for the Pelagians is I want us to see, rather than kind of get mad at them and say, oh, good, those guys are bad over here. We're so good over here, is to maybe see how in us, too, all these heretical teachings are our tendency. They're who we are apart from the grace of God, right? Apart from the clear proclamation of the gospel, we're all those other things. And even with a clear proclamation of the gospel in our ears, it's easy for us to do the same with it and twist it as long as we remain old Adam. Mm. As long as we're still in sinful flesh, it's going to be our tendency, which is why so much of the Christian life is like a rinse repeat, isn't it? It's, a, it's the life of repentance. It's death, resurrection, death, resurrection, death, resurrection. Uh, and some of that, the church year, when we have the calendar, we have a nice little picture of the church year up over by uh, the secretary office near Deaconess's office, you know, we've got the, the church calendar. How is it usually pictured? In a line like this? Or, or a stairway going up like this? But what? A circle. It's a circle. It's like a rinse repeat. Right? It's like, boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> boom. This is our rhythm of life, right? And yet, in the midst of that rhythm of life, the Lord isn't apart from it, but He's joined Himself with it. How do we know that? He does. What did he do when he joined? How do we know he's joined with us in it? He said so. He says so. Absolutely. He brings it to us in baptism through the word that became flesh. 
He lifted. He joined himself with us. He became our brother in that sense, right? Uh, we read about that in Hebrews uh, chapter 2 and 3. So these Pelagians are our tendency. So are all of these sort of false teachings. And if, if it's not you, you say, thanks be to God. Right? Thanks be to God that that's not where he, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not tempted to be a Pelagian, but I'm tempted to be something else, right? Um, so it doesn't mean everyone is one you're going to always be tempted to be. But I would argue the Pelagian heresy is just part of what it means to be old Adam. Meaning, I think that I'm doing, even if it's just this much, semi, 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 semi Pelagian. Kind of, kind of, kind of me. That's what I think. That's what we think as sinners. And yet, this is, this is condemned in here. Uh, and I think some of it is because we look to the external in behavior. <coughs> Who's the only one that knows the heart or the motive? God. God. Do you even know your own motive? No. No. Sometimes. But they yeah. usually is bad. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. But we know that from the Word, right? The Word is the light that exposes the darkness of our own hearts, right? Uh, and, and that also then gives that light to us as a gift, the light of, of, of Christ. <clears throat> so, so with this, the, the, uh, there, there's a fight, and the fight quite simply is this. What part does my choosing and doing play in my salvation? Either in my getting myself ready to receive the gospel, or something else that where I contributed. So uh, in the um, apology of this article, which remember apology in the <coughs> theology doesn't mean you say I'm sorry, but it means it's the defense of this particular uh, doctrine. It's so good, by the way. Uh, if you ever want to, I like the way that the reader's edition lays this out, the ones we have around here. I would encourage you, if you're able, to have one of these. Book of Concord, the uh, the reader's edition here. It's got great pictures. <laughs> if you're not so much a word guy. Uh, but what I love about it uh, is, is it gives you history and background that's really helpful and beautiful. But um, like in here, for instance, wait, I'm in the article of free will. Uh, oh, now I'm going to this one. This one's good. So, so we have the apology. I, I forgot I'm not going to the apology. I'm going to the formula of Concord. So all, all these different documents are pretty much expansions of what's already confessed in the Augsburg Confession. So the Augsburg Confession, what are the other writings that we had right before 1530? Does anybody know? Small called articles. Well, that was later. <clears throat> but 1529, you learned it in order to receive the Lord's Supper and be confirmed. Small, the small catechism and then the large catechism, which is connected to it, right? Those are written like about the same time. And maybe think of uh, the large catechism as sermons or a devotional teaching on the small catechism. Maybe a simple way to think of it. Sometimes we get intimidated with these documents, and I think that we should not be intimidated. We should just swim in them. Go to the deep end sometimes, and just go swim around. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's like my old swimming teacher just threw me in the water to figure it out. No, it wasn't very nice of her. <laughs> it was a horrible teacher. <laughs> in fact, in fact, side story, because I have ADD. Uh, for years, really? I know, you, I know, no one knows it. Uh, I don't even have to go get diagnosed. Uh, <laughs> watch a video of myself once. Um, but um, the, the, uh, the teacher I had was, was made me so afraid of the water that later I had to go when I was like in fifth grade and take swimming lessons again all over. Because I wanted to be able to swim and hold my breath so that I could be baptized. Because <laughs> I was afraid of the water. And in the Baptist churches, 
They don't just pour water over you or sprinkle you. What do they do? They'll dunk you. you. Dunk. I was so afraid of that dunk. <laughs> it's like, man, it's going to go up my nose. I'm going to die. <laughs> that was part of my fear. So. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> so the... Uh, Here's why I, th I say this is still a problem. It's because even after the Augsburg Confession, even after the defense of the apology of the Augsburg Confession, here we still have the same problem for people who say, yeah, I believe in the Augsburg Confession, and yet they still get it wrong on free will. It's still a problem. They're still kind of semi-Pelagians. They still kind of think that, eh, it's part. And so the... Solid declaration of the formula of Concord um, says this, because I think it's actually really help, helpful. It, it says, a division about free will has arisen not only between the Papists and us, or the Roman Catholics and the, and the Lutherans, uh, but also among some of the theologians, or the teachers, of the Augsburg Confession themselves. So people who read... These articles said, yeah, I believe, I believe these articles, right? I believe all of them. Uh, and yet they still, it's like, well, no, you don't because you teach this and that goes against this. And that's sort of what's happening uh, is, is clarity in this. Because if you remember, to be, to be fair, we sort of think of these guys as all these really learned fellows, which some of them really were. Like, I don't think we have somebody today who would say, well, he's, he's done as much as Luther. Uh-uh. I mean, the guy, I, I don't know how he did anything. I mean, half of what he did, I have no idea, uh, by God's grace. But now we're dealing with, uh, with, with some of these people who, remember, they didn't even know when they were visited the Lord's Prayer. They didn't know uh, the Ten Commandments. They, so they kind of go from really knowing nothing to being taught well. Um, so s between some of these theologians, um, there's some disagreement. And some of it is because there's not only the Lutheran Reformation going on, but what else is happening at the same time? Age of Enlightenment. Well, that's beginning to really happen, right? The pre-enlightenment moving towards progress and I mean, all kinds of historical things are, are making this happen. Um, there's a big, big, big teacher in the church named Erasmus that's there, and his whole thing is on the freedom of the will, which is how Luther ends up responding to it and writing a book called The Bondage of the Will. But Erasmus this is kind of like the quintessential poet, artist, cool theologian. Like, he's pretty cool when you study him. You're like, man, that guy dressed cool. He had really cool rings. He had great pictures. He was an influencer <laughs> in social media terms before there was such a thing. And he's one of the early guys to print his stuff. His stuff gets printed everywhere, which also helps Luther. Because you have this printing press, which is brand new, right? But this guy Erasmus is printing all this stuff about the human will, and that's influenced the church's teaching too. Uh, and, and not only Roman teaching, but he spends a lot of time in Sweden, where there's reformation going on with Ulrich uh, uh, Zwingli. Remember the, yeah. the Swiss reformer up there? I, I said Sweden. Switzerland. Switzerland, yeah. Switzerland, yeah. Uh, and he also goes to Denmark and other places. Erasmus is all over, and then he's got these disciples all over. And, to be fair, uh, it comes into Lutheran uh, teaching uh, sort of practically through some of the ways later that Melanchthon wants to word things. <clears throat> because he's under a lot of pressure. After Luther dies especially, you remember he alters the Augsburg Confession. He changes it up, and uh, that's why you'll see sometimes uh, church is being named after the original Augsburg Confession. They're Augustana, which is what it means in Latin. Oh, yeah. The Augustana, which is the 1530, the, this Augsburg Confession we're learning. Right? But what he did is later, because of pressure, political 
personal, his friends in jail, a lot of threats. Guess what? He did what a human might do to be charitable. It's, he's, in fact, uh, some guys, in my opinion, are in Lutheran historical circles are a little mean to him. Because they're not, I think we should be understanding Binti. Ben, Binti, everything that's a problem in the church is all Melanchthon's fault. <laughs> you know, like, well, it's because Melanchthon did that. I think, oh, that's not fair. Uh, but he brings in the stuff that I think that we in our sinful flesh bring in anyway. And when you're pressured, you just say, if not for the grace of God, that could be me too. Right? So, that's a little bit of context in this. Um, so, this says, mankind's free will is found and can be considered in four unique conditions. So when we say free will, always make sure you're defining terms, just like you would with any conversation. What, is, what are you talking about? When you say free will, what do you mean? Right? That's important. So here's four conditions of it. The question now is not what the condition of mankind was before the fall. We're not, no, one, no one disagreed about that. Before the fall, guess what? Man was free to do or not to do, right? To sin or to obey God. And we know that, why? How would we know that? It's in the Word. Yeah, remember God says, if you do this, then you're going to die. If you eat that fruit. I've given you all this other fruit, but that one's not for eating. Are you um, sure he said that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So then, so before the fall, that's not the problem. Or what he's able to do in outward things, like we're talking about here, see? <clears throat> uh, to do God's commandments outwardly. No one's arguing about that. The outwardly people can be, appear to be good Christians, right? And not do horrible things outward. Not kill people, not steal, not take somebody's wife or their property. Those kinds of things. He can show up to church every week, do these outward behaviors. Okay. Uh, uh, <coughs> since the fall and before his conversion. Um, so that wasn't the problem. Even though it's a Pelagian problem, because they think they have some inward ability, that wasn't the problem amongst those who said, I'm a, I'm a Lutheran. What was the problem then? The chief question is only this and this alone. What is the intellect and will of the unregenerate person to do in his own conversion and regeneration from his own powers remaining after the fall? <coughs> is he able when God's... Here's, here, here's what he's talking about here. Is he able when God's word is preached and God's grace is offered to prepare himself for grace, accept this grace, and agree with it. So now we're dealing with what comes into Baptist circles about accepting Jesus into your life kind of language. Right? Did you get that? Do you understand what the question is? Mary? I was raised Roman Catholic. Right. I had to I can't to go in the dark confessional. Yeah, you had to do the confessional. Yeah. What What about those of you uh, who maybe Deborah? Weren't, didn't you come from a Baptist background like me? Yes. So you you kind of know about this. What? Tell me what your <coughs> summation of maybe what the Baptist teaching would be. On. On. Uh, <coughs> Maybe uh, when God, okay, they would put out a call. God's word is preached. Now, now what? You mean put out a call for a pastor, or no? Or you mean for somebody to be now, saved? Now you're too Lutheran. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've been taught well. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, like, put in, like towards the end of a service, like an altar oh, call yeah, is altar what they call. would call it. Yeah, they'd have there's you some all sort of a Billy come Graham come crusade kind right. of. Right. They'd have you up. They'd sing a certain song. And We're only gonna sing it one more time if right, no one comes. Right. keep singing it. So they get more people to walk up Every because head. they, they oh. viewed it as a public proclamation that. They were saved and, and show everybody like Jesus did. That was their thing. Right. So, like, uh, you know, you couldn't be saved unless you 
said you were. Right. And, and you had to do some kind it. of preparation yeah, to you accept You had to accept uh, Jesus right. in your heart, and you showed everybody right. that by walking up to the front of the church and doing right. that. That's right. That's, right. that's your demonstration or your mm -hmm. obedience right. or something like that. And that's kind of the American revivalist. comes from revivalism, which was big here. Okay. So the chief question, though, amongst Lutheran is kind of like an old, like what becomes later a Baptist problem. Kristen? I just had a question about sure. that. Do you did, do Baptists have to do that every Sunday? Like every time they have a service? Mm -hmm. it, depends like on, a, it depends on the, uh, the pastor and the church. Okay. Um, I've been to churches like Calvary Chapels, mm -hmm. mostly did it, at, like that became part of every single Sunday service. And they're very rooted in Baptist. How many times were you saved? <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was uh, baptized. I mean, my mother-in-law said she, swimming my mother -in -law <laughs> said she was saved like ten or twelve times. I mean, she walked up ten or twelve times <laughs> to get saved. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you just go. If you're yeah, so, Linda, you. Yeah, you I I was brought up formative years in the first Christian church, Disciples of Christ. Okay. Very similar to the Baptist church. Deb and I've talked about that a lot. And um, no, everybody didn't come up the front of the last hymn, but that was the call. If you were about 12 years old, that was kind of the, the age. Uh, oh, yeah. Then if you accepted Jesus Christ, right? you know, then you would walk up by yourself and then that would start the preparation of baptism. You would have to go to some classes, right? Yeah. right prepare, and then the baptism was to, would take place in mm -hmm. our church. It was in back of the altar. It was right there. It was a pool. Okay. And you were, you were baptized there. And Deborah? And it was, people would go up to to rededicate their lives too because sure. they've yes. been sitting so well, much. Well, because we're not seeing enough people coming for the first time. We need to, if we don't <laughs> right. see activity, they would go, it doesn't right. encourage yeah. additional activity. You get rebaptized, yeah. make it ready yeah. for the first time, do a second, third, fourth, you know. I was in churches where they, would, they had plants. Meaning they not not like vegetation, <laughs> but uh, they planted people in there to go forward to be the example. They did that at the outdoor events, and that's the way Franklin Graham and some of the Billy Graham people would do it, and some of the other. I guarantee you, like the Osteen kind of places or whoever else, you know, when you see that thing, that some of that is going on. But also, you can manipulate and coerce. Humans, we know that, and this is how we know it. This is what I told all the pastors at the pastors' retreat. You know that we can coerce people into doing things because we see it happen all the time. We have an entire industry built on it called the entertainment and concert industry. We know we can manipulate and make emotions happen. If we have enough money, we can do it. Why? Because you hire great musicians. Whether, you know, if you want to reach this target people, you spend tons of money, you get the be most beautiful, let's say it's sort of a classical crowd, an older crowd that you'd like to just, just get a symphony up there. Beautiful thing and have wonderful singing. You spend enough money and whatever the style is, or maybe it's more a country western kind of thing. Just hire you know, Randy Travis or something. You pay enough money, you can get anybody you want uh, there. And then just sing it enough time. Do it again and again, and do it again and again, and you start, oh yeah, that feels really good. You put the lights up and change the mood. I mean, we can manipulate and coerce all kinds of things. You know, uh, you were th uh, talking about circular uh, 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 thinking as far as repentance and then forgiveness and, and you know, in that way. And it seems like uh, uh, that's what, what, uh, what state we're in, but the blood of Jesus, the, the water of baptism, keeps us in that relationship with God, no matter the, that old cycle of sinning and forgiveness and everything, where the Baptists would, would they base what state they're in. They made a free choice to go to church and they feel feeling really good and they're close to God and so they feel really good, but then they made a bad mistake of choice on Monday by doing some sinfulness and they feel like they're fallen out of grace and they're apart from God. You know, and so that, I mean, you know, to me, that blood of Christ that has paid for my sins has covered that, that cycle that I'm not ever away from my God. 
because I, I am I am baptized. And, and you know, that's the difference. They're, they're thinking, oh, well, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm with God. I'm, you know, I'm being bad. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm out of my relationship with God. But, but within the Baptist camp also you have other groups, right? We're painting with a broad stroke. Because yeah, yeah. there's Calvinist Baptist, there's Arminian oh, Baptist, oh, yeah. there's... But, with, but the <coughs> uncertainty of salvation yes. is, is, is constantly on with yes. them. The uncertainty yes. that they're not, they not sure that they are saved right. because of Jesus Christ. And but instead, where are they pointed? Instead of to Jesus Christ, where? Themselves. Themselves. Yeah. yeah. Did you do enough? You enough? Do you sincerely? <laughs> completely? Did totally? Complete Jessica? I have a question about um, last rites. Uh -huh. Catholic. My mom's Catholic. <coughs> um, she was very much about giving last rites, yeah. and so um, is that part of this? Is this like, as far as salvation and... Um, no, that that would do with uh, sort of the nature of, of what is the sacrament that we dealt with. Um, because we we have a service of the Lord called Commendation of the Dying that we do, but it's different uh, in the sense that uh, um, they they make it something maybe that it's not. Uh, and you have to go, what do you mean when you say sacrament? Like for the Roman church, marriage is a sacrament. Uh, ordination is a sacrament. There's seven, right? Um, that's kind of a whole other thing. But I don't think that's necessarily connected to here, but it could be uh, in the sense that it's sort of up to you to do the last rites if you're going to make it. Is that kind of what you're, how you're yeah. connecting? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so in that sense, yeah, I see, I see where you can see that those are connected. <coughs> yeah. It's really anything that we do that we attribute to our, we, we'll do this in order for, it's sort of like a transactional thing. And yet, our relationship with God uh, is all beginning to end. Who? Who's the beginning and the end? Jesus. Who's the author and finisher? Jesus. Okay. So, with that said, um, a couple of these things here I'd like to like to read. So, against those people who talk about we've got to do these things to prepare to accept uh, God's word that's preached, or I can do something kind of ahead of time uh, <coughs> that can sort of prepare me to receive this. Uh, it says against both of these parties, there was these different parties, there was also enthusiasts who taught that God converts people, this is actually a big one too, and leads them to the saving knowledge of Christ through His Spirit. <coughs> okay, so we're, all, we're on board with them so far. If you say, uh, God converts people and leads them to the saving knowledge of Christ through His Spirit, we're all like, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, good. That sounds great. Uh-oh, it's going to get weird. Without any created means and instrument. In other words, without the outward preaching and hearing of God's Word. Uh-oh. No. So that's one side. The other side is we can do something to prepare. So you've got kind of these teams amongst Lutherans. Against both of these parties, the pure teacher, teachers of the Augsburg Confession have taught and argued the following. By the fall of our first parents, mankind was so corrupted in divine things having to do with our conversion and salvation of our souls, we are by nature blind, as Ephesians 4.18 says. And when God's word is preached, a person doesn't, and can't understand God's word, but regards it as foolishness. Remember what Paul says about the uh, the Greeks. They consider it foolish. It doesn't make any sense to human reason, this gospel, that God would become a man and take my place on a cross and die for my sins. To forgive me, that makes no sense to my reason. It's foolish. Uh, or fall, folly is another thing with it. So, um, also, he does not draw near to God on his own, the sinner. He is and remains God's enemy until he is converted, becomes a believer, 
and is given faith and is regenerated and renewed according to Romans 5.10. This happens only by the Spirit's power through the means of the Word when it is preached and heard out of pure grace without any cooperation of His own. So, the big difference here is that you know, it has to do with original sin, doesn't it? Like, I believe I cannot, by my own reason or strength, come to Jesus or believe in Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me, not just through some weird thing in my heart, but how? By the gospel. By the gospel. Through the means, through the preached word, the external word, through the preached word with water, baptism, through the preached word with bread and wine. Jesus preaching his word of his supper that he brings us to. These are the ways that we are given faith, kept in the faith, uh, and every other fruit that we seek in our life as a Christian flows from that faith that we're given in those places where he says, I'm going to be here for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And so then we don't look to our free will to take us to the next level. But we look then to what? Or who? Jesus. And Jesus where? Just Jesus anywhere in creation? Jesus that is a feeling in my heart? No. Yeah, exactly where we confess the church is in Article 7 of the Oxford Confession. Where the Gospels rightly preached and the sacraments are distributed in accordance with Christ's institution. There is Christ doing exactly what he said he's going to do. Um, wow, we can't get to any of this. I, by the way, I know that you may say, why, are, why, why did you hand me this giant handout? It's huge. There's a chart in here that I want to refer you to. It's on the, let's see, you, have, you guys have a front back. I forgot to put page numbers. I'm really sorry. It was a third page. It means the third page if you're going front, back, next page. I uh, see down here the four states of man's will are summarized. I think this is helpful. Um, so we have the state before the fall. There was never a problem here. Everyone agrees with this. So the state of man's will, what is it? He's able to sin or not to sin. That's sort of what we're looking for. Right? We always wanted to return to the way it was before the fall. That's good. We should want that. And that will happen. But after the fall, then, when after original sin comes in, not able not to sin. Why? Because we have other gods. We look to self. We look at, call it whatever you want. It's sin right here. It's unbelief, unfaith, the opposite of faith. So then after conversion, after you become a Christian, after you're baptized, the Christian life, we have simultaneous saint and sinner right here, don't we? Where we, at the same time, the new man, if you will, uh, is, uh, is not able to sin. The flesh, sinful flesh of the old Adam, is not able not to sin. Uh, and then after the resurrection, we got great news. <laughs> There's awesome. Look, oh. Not able to sin. That's even better than it was originally. Isn't it? <laughs> so, if you go to the next page here, we have sort of the different views. I, I wanted you to have this because this is, I think, at the heart of a lot of differences between, you know, Reformed, Lutheran, Baptist, American Evangelical, Roman Catholic. Uh, it kind of has, again, a general view. I'm painting with a broad stroke, but it kind of gives you the basis of these different teachings. So, uh, look, do you see any difference before the fall? No. In all these different teachings? Yeah. No. no. There probably is somewhere, some weird church somewhere, like First Fundamentalist Baptist Church of the I Hate People. Uh, next, <laughs> after the fall, we have a little bit of difference, don't we? We have uh, Roman Catholic, American Evangelical, and by that, that's usually like the kind of Arminian version of things, not the Calvinist evangelicals, because they would be with the Reformed camp here. Able to sin or not to sin. 
So look, did anything change? Yeah. <laughs> With the fall? Nothing changed. No, nah, nothing changed. So dealing with pre-fall man. Uh, reformed, though, says the same, but we would agree with the reformed here, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they call it total depravity. They'll use that word. I don't think that's the best word. I don't think that's clear. I think teaching the way that historic church is taught on original sin and our confessions are a little bit clear. Mm -hmm. As someone who used to be reformed. So after conversion, the Christian life, here's where... Here's where our big difference is. This is where most of the fights happen. The gloves come off sometimes. Uh, and, and it's why we have to be careful when we're reading something. We say, I wonder what theological confession they're coming from. Maybe you're reading a book on a uh, devotional. And you might say, you know, they're probably going to be coming from this camp. And there may be some really helpful things in this book. But you learn to be discerning according to the word of God by knowing what different confessions actually confess about a Christian. So the R Roman Catholic, American Evangelical, look what happens. Is there any change at all in the Christian life of the will of man? Zero. It's the exact same before the fall, after the fall, after conversion. Everyone agrees with after the resurrection. So that's good. But then you have the reform that says able to sin or not to sin. And uh, so basically you have a sort of semi-Pelagian view here. And then there's the Lutheran view, which doesn't make, it frustrates people who love reason, human reason and systems, because it doesn't fit into any system. It's just, this is what the Bible teaches. And to us, it looks like a crazy paradox. But we let the tension stand because that's what God's word says. Period. Don't try to figure it out and tie the bow neat where God doesn't give it to us neat. Uh, not able to sin. Not able not to sin. Sorry. So not able to not sin according to the flesh. And according to our new man, not able to sin. So you see, why do we keep needing to hear the law as a Lutheran Christian. Do you see why? Because we're still in the flesh and this old man has to be put to death, doesn't he? Daily. Yeah. So it really is that third section really is all about will. Yeah. Yes. So when somebody says, do we have a free will? You say yes and no. <laughs> or you can say, what do you mean by free will? Right. Right. And usually what they mean is, am I able to do something? Uh, am I able to... And so sometimes, so our temptation is to do what the Reformed do, which is they use the law then sort of to teach you how to be a Christian. It's called the didactic use. Calvin taught that that was the chief use of the law, was to teach you how to do good things. You gotta go do we wouldn't <coughs> deny that the law teaches us good things. The law is good. The problem isn't with God's law, the problem is with inherited sin. It's that I'm still in sinful flesh. Uh, and so this is why the confessions say in the Bible teaches that the law to the sinner always accuses. Lexer semper accusat in the Latin. It always accuses. Not because it's not nice, but because I'm not nice. That's what Paul says in Romans 7. Uh, it's what's in me. So, so then uh, the law does have its place. It's a great place. We aren't antinomians. We must have the law yes. preached to us. But it doesn't, it, we don't preach the law in order to produce good works. We, pre we preach the gospel because from the gift of faith comes every good work because it's the fruit of the spirit and not the works of the flesh. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Cool. Uh, because this gets confused in Lutheran circles too. We can always confuse it. And we've got to keep doing it. Otherwise, we're going to put the emphasis in the wrong syllable and things get weird. Uh, but we can also help maybe our Christian brother or sister or our neighbor who might be listening to a Billy Graham program and say, just so you know, this is what's taught kind of about the Christian. And that's kind of important, right? Uh, 
And so we have this wonderful comfort uh, of God's word uh, that we can always go back to. Uh, and that every one of these great gifts that the Lord gives comes from this word. We can talk more about this later. The causes of sin is not God, but who? Satan. The devil and sinners. <laughs> That's what it means, the ungodly. So am I guilty for causing sin? Did I cause sin? Yeah, I did. In fact, in Adam all fell. Says mm -hmm. Paul That's right. in Romans. But just as in Adam through one man all fell, in Christ, the second Adam, all are saved, redeemed. Thanks be to God. All right, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Right, if you want to dig deeper on this, I suggest you go slowly through the solid declaration on called free will of the formula of conquering. Article 2 of the formula. Free will. You can get it online, bookofconcord.com. It's free. Just read it there. Free will. Go slow through. Pastor, uh, just an announcement. Sure. Uh, some of you have seen Luke 2 shirts. We have some of those. Um, if you want to wear a shirt, uh, we, we'll have them next Sunday here. Um, and they, um, instead of your Christmas uh, sweaters, um, it, it generates uh, some conversation. Uh, it's a ministry that uh, Kim uh, Lunsford's uh, brother-in-law runs in Southern California. But um, they're, they're nice t-shirts. We have them down in the preschool office. I'll bring them up next Sunday um, after Bible study.